Hello everyone, my name is Matt Williams and I'm an evangelist at Infra. I'm super excited to have you joining me for my session here at Comp42. It's my home lab, Why Would I Want SSO? Now that's a nice and short title for the schedule, but really that title should be, it's my home lab, why would I want single sign-on or roles or users? And this whole talk is specific to Kubernetes. I mentioned that I'm an evangelist at Infra, and we'll learn more about what Infra does later in this session. So let's get started with some definitions. What is this home lab thing in the title? Well, a home lab is whatever you want it to be. Traditionally, it's a place to practice. Maybe at work, you're using different tools and technologies like Kubernetes or something else, and you want to practice with it. You would like to try out different uses that your boss might not approve of until you prove that it's really worth trying. All of these things are great uses for a home lab. It's also a great place for tools for your home. Maybe you and your family have a shared calendar and you don't want to host it with one of the clouds. Or maybe it's collaboration tools, such as having your own file server that you share with your significant other and with your kids. All of that is a good use for a home lab. Okay, so what does a home lab look like? What goes into it? Well, there are no rules, so it's whatever you got. Yeah, you're probably going to see plenty of people on YouTube or Instagram with big professional racks that look really, really cool. And they have all sorts of fancy networking equipment and rack mounted servers. You don't need to have that. A rack isn't required. If you can afford it, well, use what you got. Maybe you have an extra laptop or even your current laptop that you have some extra cycles on. Maybe you have a Raspberry Pi or some other box that you've acquired along the way. All of those things can be used in your home lab. Maybe you actually do have a rack that you got from eBay that a company was no longer using. And so you got it really, really cheap. And maybe you got some of those older Dell servers. They work perfectly well in a home lab. So really the limit is defined by your budget, maybe even the approval levels of your significant other. So here's what was in my first home lab. I was working for a company called Capteris, and then it was bought out by OpenText. I needed to get up to speed on Faxor of IP, so I bought a used Cisco 2600 with some analog phone cards. And then I hooked up, hooked it up to the OpenText fax gateway, got some simple routers and used some virtual networking tools. Now, this was great for me at the time, but this would totally not go over well today. That Cisco box sounded like a jet engine. And remember what I said about getting approval from a significant other? <laughs> that would definitely never fly. Today, I'm a lot further along in my career, but my home lab doesn't look any more professional. My servers are just computers that don't get any love anymore. The workhorse is a 2011 Mac mini, but here you can also see that there's a pie by the utility sink next to a fly swatter. And here's a stack of pies and some other box I collected as I was bringing them together in one spot in the house. Most of the software running sits on Proxmox, a virtualization platform, but I'm also using TrueNAS to try out its virtualization tools. I have Portainer as a front end to Docker and Kubernetes. And running as VMs and containers, I have a few Kubernetes clusters using Minikube and Kind, Micro Kubernetes and K3S and more. Why? Because I want to practice and play to see what's interesting with each of them. What makes them unique and special? I also run various software experiments. Now, being married with a three-year-old means the weekend spent unwashed and eating takeout junk food, learning a new language are long since gone. But I still experiment with Next.js or Svelkit in the evening after reading Sophie Mouse to Stella. And I want a place to host those experiments. That tends to be one of the Kubernetes clusters. One of the other key bits of software running is Home Assistant. I've automated the lights and other systems based on sensors all around the house. Remember what I said about hosting a calendar? We have one that shows what the trash trucks will be taking this week. Are they also taking compost or recycling that day? And that's displayed on an old iPad on one of the walls. And of course, Home Lab doesn't just have to be machines that are located inside my home. It can also be stuff up in the cloud. So I have a bunch of accounts from AWS and Azure, Google Cloud, even Oracle Cloud. And I use all the free for life or free for trial periods. I use all those types of services on all the different clouds. And that way I can kind of spread it around, spread around the free stuff and get to play around with lots of tools without paying a whole lot. 
I think my AWS bill each month is about 53 cents. So that's what my home lab looks like today. So why Kubernetes in the home lab? Well, I talked about that a little bit a few slides ago. It's really a chance for me to practice. I use Kubernetes at work and want to understand how it works. So I play around with it at a home. And going back a few decades, when we had clusters, they had to be identical hardware. I remember running a Novell Netware active passive cluster, and they had to be absolutely identical. But these days with Kubernetes, you can have a hodgepodge of machines, like whatever these things are in this picture. And as far as computers, that's precisely what I've got, a hodgepodge of machines. Well, maybe some of those Raspberry Pis look exactly the same, but now I can have a cluster that spreads across multiple types of machines, which is awesome. And that allows me to create more consistent deployment practices, even in my own home. Remember I told you about those software experiments? I have one way to deploy all those software experiments rather than having to think about it. If I want to push it to Docker, I'm going to do it this way. If I want to do it to Proxmox containers, then there's another way. If I do want it to go to Kubernetes, then it's this other way. Now I have one way to deploy all these software experiments or other tools that I find on the internet. So if I'm using lots of different tools that I find online and one of them gets compromised while running as admin, it now has access to the secrets and data of all the other services. And that's bad. So by implementing users and roles and least privilege, I can go a long way toward avoiding those problems. Okay, so let's talk about users. Well, they don't exist. Everything in Kubernetes is a resource and there's no resource for users. Actually, users are just certificates. So to create a user, we need to create certificates and then put those certs into a kubeconfig file. So here's what that file looks like, minus some of the actual super long strings that are the certs. Up at the top, we have the cluster and how to access it. Down at the bottom is the user and the cert associated with it. In the middle is the context that links user to cert. And we can have many of each type defined in a single file. Okay, so what is a role? Well, a role just defines a level of access that a user has to the cluster. And that level of access is defined with a resource and a verb. Now here's an example of a role. This role is called marketing dev. And it says that for the pod resource, the user can get, watch, and list. Normally there'd be a lot of sets of resources and verbs, but I wanted to keep it simple for this session. But that's how we create a role, just define it in a YAML file then apply that to the cluster. So let's create a user with the tools built into Kubernetes and the OS. It's not hard, but it is a bit tedious. It's all about creating the key, signing it, then adding it to your kubeconfig file. Easy, right? So you create the key and then a cert certificate signing request. That request goes to the server, then use the kubectl command to approve it. Next, you download the signed request and build the kubeconfig file. Finally, you distribute the file. The commands I showed were fragments of the real command, but you can find the full commands with explanations on this blog post. Now, possession of this cert means you have access to the cluster. So it's important to verify the user still has access. That can be done by regenerating the certs and redistributing the config file every five to 30 minutes. And of course that sounds painful. So you might come back to the idea of just giving everyone admin access. Well, remember, Kubernetes is just remote execution as a service. And if everything shares the same credentials and one job or user is compromised, then the entire environment is compromised. Maybe a user isn't compromised, but is fired. One disgruntled user with admin can do a lot of damage. So if admin for all isn't a great solution, surely there must be a way to automate it. I'll give you two solutions here. First is this script from Brendan Burns. Now today, Brendan is a corporate vice president at Microsoft. But eight years ago, Joe Beta, Craig McLucky, and Brendan created a little open source project you might have heard of called Kubernetes. And this script basically goes through the same steps I did just now. But it skips what is probably the hardest part, distribution of that config file. So how about something easier and more self-contained? Well, that's where infra comes in. Infra is a 100% open source solution to this problem. It's 100% free to use. We've been working on it for a couple of years now, and the original founders also created another open source tool called Kitematic. 
There are two ways you can use it. You can use it, you can host it yourself, or you can use Infra Cloud when we fully release it. Though, if you're interested, we can get you in on the beta. So let's do a demo now to see how easy it is. Okay, so here we are at the command line. I'm going to install Infra, the server, to my Kubernetes cluster. I'm using Docker Desktop uh, for my Kubernetes cluster. And I'm going to use a values file. So I'm just going to show you this uh, demo values. It's really simple. Um, and it just shows that I'm defining a user. That user is called matt at example.com. It's got a password of password. Now, normally I wouldn't be doing a password as password because it's not very secure. Um, but uh, uh, normally I would create a secret in Kubernetes and then refer to that secret within this file. But it's a demo, so excuse me. Um, and then I've got a grant. Uh, and that grant just says that matt at example.com um, that you just defined is an admin within the resource of infra. Okay, cool. So now we can run Helm upgrade dash dash install infra hq slash infra. And I'm gonna specify the values file of demo values dot yaml. And that's it, we're installed. Um, one of the things it tells me is if I run this command, it'll get me the endpoint where my server is. And there it's localhost. So let's go ahead and open up the browser and go to localhost. And when it first starts, it can take a few seconds for it to, uh, to boot up. Um, but if I refresh, <clears throat> there we go. And my uh, login screen shows up. So I created a user called matt at example.com. And the password is password. Okay, so now I'm in. First step I want to do, other than zoom in, a bunch is to connect a cluster. So I'm going to call this the Docker desktop. And it gives me a command to run. So I'll copy this and go back to here. I'll paste that in. <clears throat> now you might be thinking, wait, you just installed Infra and you have to do another install. Well, this is a self-hosted instance of Infra, and there's two pieces to it. There's the Infra server, um, which is what you're gonna log into and has the kind of authoritative source for user information. But then there's the connector. And so you might have one, well, you will have one server, and then lots of connectors, one for each of the clusters that uh, you want to manage. Uh, now, there's one other thing that I want to add to this. Well, let's take a look at this command. It's Helm upgrade install, um, and then I'm installing the infra connector. Well, that's what I'm going to call it. And it's at the same repo uh, that we used before, I think. And then I'm setting a server host of localhost. And then I want to call this Docker desktop. When I use the UI, I want to call this particular cluster Docker desktop. And then I'm setting an access key. That access key, it just lets the connector tell, gives gives the connector something to give to the server to say, yeah, hey, I'm the connector that you just, you know, uh, generated that command for. Now there's one more thing. Because I'm using Docker Desktop and I'm using self-signed certificates uh, and I'm not using Let's Encrypt or some other solution for certificates, I need to tell it to, well, I need to tell it something. So, uh, what was it? It was this command. So here I'm at saying set connector.config.skip TLS verify is true. 
That just uh, lets me skip any sort of problems with my self-signed certificates. Normally, in the real world, uh, with real clusters, you would never do this. Uh, it's just because it's on Docker Desktop and I'm using self-signed certificates. So I can press Enter. And now I'm done. So now if I go back to the um, browser, you can see my cluster has been connected. So I can click on Finish. So now it knows about my Docker desktop. In fact, if I click on this, I'll see I can grant access to individual users to the whole uh, cluster, as well as individual namespaces. I only have one user. So let's go ahead and create a new user. I'll add user, and I'll call them user1 at example.com. And it generates a temporary password. I'm going to copy that and uh, save it. OK, so that defines a new user. I can also define groups. So if I have you know a dozen, a uh, hundred users, and some are dev, some are QA, some are marketing, some are you know whatever other groups inside a dev, um, I can create groups that have each of those users. So I'll add a group. I'll call it dev. And now for dev, I want to add both Matt and user one. Now, if you have hundreds of users, like I suggested, you probably wouldn't want to enter them manually here. You could also use the command line, and you can uh, uh, add a whole bunch of users right there on the command line, but you're probably not even going to want to do that. Instead, you probably have something like Okta or Google uh, OIDC or Azure AD or another OIDC provider. And so with providers, you can just connect to those and we'll get all the users and groups from there. But my users and groups are, are my test users and groups are set. So now I want to grant access. Let's see. Um, for the entire thing, I want to grant my dev group, uh, let's say view access and add that. And then for, let's go to uh, the default namespace. And I'll add Matt as an admin. And I'll add user one. Uh, let's give him exec and add that. OK, so now I'm set. Now I can go back to my terminal. And you know, one thing I'm going to do is what directory am I in? I'm Matt downloads. So I'll go to um, .kube, and when I run kubeconfig or uh, when I run uh, um, kubectl or any Kubernetes command, it's getting my configuration, configuration information from this config file. So I'm just going to move the config file, move config to config.conf42. And so now if I run kctx, uh, which is the context plugin for crew for kubectl, it says oh, there, are no, uh, um, there are no Kubernetes clusters. So I'm going to cancel that. And now I can run infra install. And what was my first user? Matt at uh, example.com. Not install. It's infra login. It's not that. That's not. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Login localhost. Because that's where I want to log into. I don't want to log in to the user. I want to log into my cluster. Uh, I want to trust this certificate. And now my username is matt at example.com and the password is my super secure password. Okay, so now which directory I'm in? I'm still in .cube. So now let's take a look at um, 
uh, config. And we see right away, there's a bunch of things in here. Um, so I can see uh, I've got a cluster that's been defined. Um, and the name of that is infra Docker desktop. I've got another cluster defined, which is Docker desktop default. I've got a context. I've got a couple of contexts. And then I've got a user, matt at example.com. That's pretty cool. And so now I can just run uh, you know, kctx, and I see both of those uh, contexts that exist. And if I go into any one of them, let's say that one, uh, and you do uh, um, get pods, I see everything. Cool. But if I were to go in as, let's say, infra login localhost, and my user is user1 at example.com, password. Oh, wait, no, the password was that new password I was given. And I have to update it because it's a, a temporary password. I'll set it to password, password. And now if I do, um, let's do bat config. I see the same things, except down at the bottom, my user is user at user one at example.com. So the user for, oh, actually my uh, older Matt at example.com uh, is still there. If I had run infra uh, login or infra logout before logging in as user one, then the Matt at example.com user information would have been uh, purged from my, uh, from my config file. But, you know, if I want to take a look at infra list, this just shows me, okay, I'm, I have view access to the whole cluster, but I also have exec access just to the default namespace. So what we've done here is uh, create a, create two users and assign them different roles, view and exec. Um, view is uh, one of the default roles that comes with Kubernetes. Exec is one of three roles that we add um, as part of the, when we install the connector. So we add exec, we add port forward, we add logs, I think that's it. Um, and then you can also add your own um, roles. You know, any role that you've created in your Kubernetes cluster, just add one annotation, one label to it, and we'll be able to see that and then be able to assign those roles within the UI. Or actually you can do everything um, uh, everything from the command line as well. You don't just have to use the UI. So that's the quick demo. Let's run back to the presentation. In summary, you've seen that Home Labs let you practice with whatever tools and technologies you want to practice with. Things at work or things you wish you were doing at work. If you are using, if you're using Kubernetes either at work or at home, you should be using users and roles and single sign-on. Unfortunately, users in Kubernetes are hard, but tools like Infra and that script from Brendan Burns help make it easier. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter or at Technovangelist. Uh, and of course, I'll also be in the, the was it Discord. Uh, thanks so much and goodbye.